Okay. Okay, so let's start. I will, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today a um, very um, successful, I consider him very successful alumni of, of Western, uh, who, whom we are very proud of. It's Dr. John uh, Galsorsi. Uh, he is world leading wind engineer and he's recognized expert for wind effects on tall buildings. Um, I have his uh, impressive bio biography, but I am gonna talk about John from my, uh, my own memories here. So uh, John was, uh, did his undergrad at Western and then he, after that joined the wind tunnel to do his master degree under the supervision of uh, Professor, Professor Barry Vickery. And when he was uh, starting his uh, master at, uh, at Western, I was starting my career here as an assistant professor. And I will share with you something I don't know John recall or not, but at that time he was teaching a course uh, in our department as a sessional and uh, we uh, interviewed him for a position as assistant professor. So the committee decided to go to the class. I was part of the committee. I was very young at that time, five professors, and we sat at the back of the class to get the chance to assess his teaching. And I recall one of the students, he looked at his back and found all those professors sitting. And then he told us, hire him, hire him. He's, he's very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, John did his graduate uh, studies here in his PhD. I recall he took one of my very difficult course. I'm still keeping his paper because I think he ended up with 100% in uh, my heavy uh, finite element course. Um, and then I, I know that he went and he worked in the, in the wind tunnel and then worked at RWDI um, for many years. And, and then after that, now I'm going to follow his, his bio because I, I'm not, it's hard to keep track about uh, what John is doing because he moves successfully between uh, various places. So, um, um, I will go back to his directory, like he has directed the wind engineering studies of several of the most complex and ambitious designs over the past 10 years. Internationally, those include uh, Jeddah Tower, uh, Merdebeka Mer PNB 118, and International Finance Center. Uh, in North America, notable project includes the uh, Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, Vista Tower in Chicago, and in New York, the Stanway building and all the buildings of the Hudson Yard. Uh, he also has a lot of activities in terms of code development and research. So he was involved in the development of building codes in North America, member of the ASE 7 wind load subcommittee, and he's currently the chair of the National Building Code of Canada task group on climate loads. Uh, he's registered professional engineers in various provinces in Canada and uh, and US, and uh, uh, currently he's the managing director of the Cermak uh, Peterka Peterson Wind Engineering Consultants. And uh, so now I think I uh, I took too much in my my introduction, so I will pass it to John to uh, to give you his uh, his presentation, which I'm sure will be very inspiring to all of you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Aldamati. It's, uh, as you told those stories, I brought back fond memories. I, uh, in that, I remember that class, I was teaching second year mechanics and materials. And I, and as you guys can all imagine on the call, I was quite nervous. And um, so I was, I was thankful to have students in the, in the room that were advocating for me, because I think Otherwise, Kerry Rowe might have given me a hard time for making a sign error when I was teaching Morse Circle. That's that's something I remember very, very specifically. But, uh, but yeah, it's been uh, it's been a great uh, great memories of my time at Western, and and always uh, appreciate the invitation to come back and speak, even if it's virtually. Um, but uh, many many good friends on the call. So let me see if I can get this to work. We should have maybe tried this beforehand, but yeah, I'm going to try to start the slideshow. There, I've got the wrong screen. I 
that should be better. Yeah. And folks seeing the full screen now, great. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to, um, I mean, I've been, I've had uh, a, now already a long career, it's been 25 years um, that I've been uh, working in wind engineering and related, role, related roles, related companies and management positions and technical positions. Um, as I've, uh, you know, reconnected and, and building a team with uh, CPP, so CERMAC, Paterka, Peterson, in Canada, we're not allowed to say CPP for the obvious reasons. Uh, the federal government kind of gets upset at us. So, uh, so we branded ourselves as Cermak Paterka Peterson, and I'll give you some history of the company here in a minute. Um, but today, I wanted to talk. Here's the title. Uh, this was the I, I sent. I believe uh, the abstract was sent around. I'm going to deviate from that a little bit. Maybe talk a little bit more general, knowing that this is a more general audience. Um, but also, as I go through, try to, in a, whether that's advice, whether it's tips of, of how, how uh, or some things I've learned in, in interacting with uh, other professionals. So one of the things as a, uh, as a wind engineer, but generally for anyone on the call, as you're entering into your career, you're going you're gonna to be uh, interacting with a broad spectrum of folks, uh, some engineering, some non-engineering. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll share some of those perspectives on how on how to uh, keep one's eye open and, and understand where you can have the most impact on the assignments that you get in your career. So let me start with um, this may sound a little bit like a commercial, but uh, see if I can get this to move. There we go. Um, and talk a little bit about CPP wind engineering. Um, so CPP Wind Engineering is, is a, a long-standing company in, in wind engineering. Um, I say here it was founded in 1981 as a company. The actual history of, of CPP goes back to uh, Jack Cermak's early days as a young academic post-World War II. So that's a long, long time ago. Um, and he was involved in air quality studies. Uh, John Paterka then joined him. And... and um, Jack Cermak actually didn't start the company until he was at the very end of his career uh, in as an academic. He was able to uh, keep an emeritus appointment, but uh, it started uh, CPP in 1981. Um, the company's got on. Uh, so we had our 40th birthday last fall, um, but we've had a, a good four decades of success and CPP principals and senior staff, a big part of the company is really uh, participation in in professional development and, and uh, the, the pursuit of excellence within the profession. So we're, we're involved with a variety of different committees of different agencies. Um, so as a company, about 150 employees and location-wise, we're in uh, Fort Collins, which is where uh, uh, CPP was originally founded coming out of Colorado State University. And then over the last 18 months, I've been growing a team in the uh, Toronto area and we'll soon have an office. And then in uh, my colleague, Pete Bork, leads the team in uh, Sydney, Australia, where about 50 folks are there. Um, connections to Western have gone back really to the origin of wind engineering at, at Western and really the, the origin of wind engineering as a recognized name of a field. Um, so I hope everybody on the call knows the history of Alan Davenport at, at Western Ontario. And he had the, uh, in his early career, Alan had put together kind of the formulation of connecting a number of different things um, that were all special specialty studies at the time, um, but developed a framework to, to assess wind loads using, using a wind tunnel. He was influenced by uh, Martin Jensen and some others, uh, Kit Scruton, from Europe, and uh, he had the opportunity to lead the studies on the World Trade Center. So it should be kind of well-known history. At Western, what you may not know though, is that Allen at the time didn't have a, uh, a wind tunnel. And the only wind tunnel that was uh, designed, in North America anyway, that was designed to, uh, to model uh, the atmospheric boundary layer was at Colorado State. And so Jack Cermak and, and Alan collaborated on it, certainly under the direction of Alan, but, the, but it kind of set off a, a decades-long 
uh, friendship and, and collaboration uh, later on uh, codes and standards and, and other things. And as we kind of fast forward to today, um, you know, those connections have stayed strong. Uh, my colleagues, Dave Banks, Roy Noon, others uh, that are well-known wind engineers that become friends. I've known them all. I've known them both for over 20 years. So it was a natural um, evolution or, or uh, progression for me to come into to CPP. But uh, there's a lot of uh, strong EWO connections with alumni that are current employees, and I've listed them there. Uh, from William Lynn to Tom Mara, Sarah Stenaba, Mary Murfan, Jubair, Chowdhury, Fahad Akhan, and, and uh, Kaiten Kwan, and then I'm the old guy. Um, but it's uh, a really strong connection, and um, and we owe a lot to those uh, as a company to those connections into uh, to CPP. Um, I know not all of you on the call, or or maybe just a small subset of you, are uh, in the wind program, the wind research program within the environmental, civil and environmental um, department. So I thought I would just really quickly go over uh, some of our facilities. We've got new wind tunnels that we developed in Colorado over the last uh, several years in 2018. Um, some neat features of those. Um, we've got a blockage tolerant section, which uh, comes in handy from time to time. We've got a lot of uh, different things that enable us to automate roughness, which is not new compared to the uh, history of the, the boundary and wind tunnel at Western, but also, but also some things that we've incorporated into the test section that allows us to do topography studies and some other things a little bit more, uh, more readily. So blockage tolerance part of that, and then some movable roughness elements. Uh, also, we've got a strong uh, computational team there based uh, primarily in Sydney, but we're starting to grow that in uh, North America. And we've used that, uh, at least to date, primarily on, um, on microclimate studies, uh, but that's obviously a, a, a rapidly developing field and, and something that uh, some of your, uh, uh, the academics at Western are, uh, are working on. So what do we do? Um, Anything from wind loads on structures to air quality to um, things closer to ground, indoor environment, outdoor environment. And um, being in the United States, we've got the opportunity to work on uh, some, some more, I guess, secret type of projects. Um, the example lower right, we get involved with a lot of aerospace type of uh, top type of projects and some things that uh, because of Security were uh, were uniquely positioned to do. Um, so that's what we do. Here's some of some of the examples over my time, my relatively short time that we've uh, that we've won some projects and uh, taken them through to various stages. Um, getting back into tall residential skyscrapers in New York City and other cities um, through commercial buildings through sports to museums to airports. So we really get to work across a full um, spectrum. Those are all what I would call architectural engineering. Um, we also get into institutional and lab and healthcare type of projects as well through, uh, through colleagues on the air quality side of our business. Um, again, since everybody's, uh, it's more of a general audience, um, just Bear with me for a few minutes and we could just take you through a little bit of the process. So um, that wind tunnel schematic that I showed, here's what it looks like in reality, where you've got quite uh, sophisticated instrumentation. Um, and so we need a really highly qualified team of technicians and model builders and, and uh, what we used to call drafts people are really more design folks now. They, they really are expert in 3D modeling technologies. So that's been an interesting evolution over, over my time where um, that has become a much more integrated part of the team. Um, so the wind engineering folks definitely oversee the project, but as, but as far as the detailed expertise, it's really far too much for, for one engineer to know and they rely on, uh, on the expertise at a technician level to really get things uh, done effectively. Um, looking at the... Um, Details of how things get done in the wind tunnel, just a little bit more here. This would be review for some, but 
uh, the whole idea of a boundary layer wind tunnel is to model the natural wind. So we have to take essentially smooth flow and then trick it into acting like a boundary layer that you'd uh, have in the in the um, in the atmosphere in the atmospheric boundary layer. We we don't have the uh, the luxury of the boundary layer wind tunnel at Western that is this really long fetch. So we we have to rely more on spires and trips and and other things to establish that flow. Um, and then what we're actually modeling in schematic form, it looks something like this. So we're trying to model those wind effects around buildings and you know, then measuring wind loads, um, whether that's at a component and cladding level, whether that's at an overall structural level, whether that's at a microclimate level. So th these are more microclimate um, focused type of slides that we use in communicating with uh, the more visual of our of our clients, typically architects uh, like to communicate this way. Um, well, we get with uh, different, oops. Looks like I had some duplication here. There we go. Um, where this is what we're trying to model um, with, some, with some different uh, um, understanding of uh, bluff body aerodynamics, but eventually get into Deliverables working with uh, working with cladding consultants, which is a really specialized subset um, that could be in an architect, it could be in an engineering. So examples in uh, Canada, RJC, uh, Reed Jones, Christofferson, I think Intuitive, another well-known structural engineer. They they both have uh, envelope practices, which has been a developing field in Canada compared to to the states where it really matured in the North, U.S. Northeast. Where the building envelope, and the reason that's developed as a as a specialty uh, beyond the architects is uh, the building envelope really is where a lot of things collide. Whether that's energy modeling, whether that's uh, architectural detailing, so aesthetics, um, performance as far as uh, water ingress, all those in addition to wind loads. So there's a, a really unique and uh, specialized set of clients that we would work with, providing information such as this. Now, uh, if we get through to um, our structural engineering friends, then uh, we're we're developing overall loads for them, and that starts with uh, high resolution measurement in the wind tunnel, and then bringing in all the techniques of uh, random vibration to uh, to develop um, overall equivalent static loads. And then finally, I mentioned. Um, at the start, that you know, a big part of my career has been has been uh, working with folks outside of engineering, not just architects, but uh, developers, owners, um, interested parties, um, and and the service that that's really uh, been a focus or becomes a focus is in really uh, understanding or helping clients understand uh, the microclimate. So. That starts with wind measurements, but but today is extended into much more of a, a, a much broader um, interpretation of microclimate that includes uh, thermal comfort and includes um, water issues, rainwater modeling, um, as uh, you know, outdoor comfort and design of specific spaces, um, not only for uh, the effects of wind on uh, people and the occupants and the pedestrians, but also those uh, particular pieces of, of infrastructure or, or uh, things that make up the space. So uh, as I say, we've, uh, we've got a strong computational team at, uh, at CPP and we developed that. It's become much more of a, of a common uh, practice of ours to actually move away from the wind tunnel and model things in, uh, in CFD, mainly for the, uh, for the, um, the quality of the graphics that you get out of it, as, as well as some technical gains as well. So these, these still look very much like engineering type drawings, but here's a wind tunnel output on the left and here's a, a CFD output on the right. Um, but where it becomes really powerful, just to show this slide again, is really helping visual people understand what's happening in the in their microclimate in their built environment 
and then help them help them um, understand the issues and then participate with them in developing solutions. And so those and, and some of those interactions, I wouldn't have thought that going in, in, into my career being highly focused as a grad student, as uh, you know, where, where many of you are today. Um, but, you know, being welcomed to the table because of that expertise, but what has led to the more fulfilling times in my career is, is really working with a broad team, a multi, uh, a multi talented team uh, to, to develop solutions. And that requires good communication. It requires, um, you know, really putting yourself in their shoes, you know, some, some degree of empathy and uh, trying to get to, you know, a, a, at its root, um, an understanding of, of their perspective. And that's made me and, and, and uh, those at uh, CPP and other places I work, um, it's made our impact that much more, uh, more meaningful. And to be frank, it allows some of the tougher conversations that have to happen around a, a, a design team table when, uh, when you've got folks of strong opinion and you need to uh, be in a position where you uh, need to convince them why uh, the value or what, why the, the pieces of information that we're bringing to the table are important. And just some examples here, interactions with architects, and this has become more and more a part of uh, my work in recent years at a, at a pedestrian level, you know, helping uh, to introduce or suggest changes that, um, that improve the, the local microclimate for wind. Um, but also it gets into the details of how spaces are being used now. And with, the, with the development of uh, high-rise residential um, being much more common. In fact, it's what's driving a lot of uh, construction in North America over the last 10 years. And the high value attached to those and then uh, those spaces and buildings, there's an impetus to really use every square foot as best you can um, and to bring high quality spaces. So high quality spaces on, uh, on a tall building uh, when you're, you know, potentially several hundred feet or 100 meters up in the air, um, is a challenge, and um, you know, helping helping architects and uh, developers understand that. So these are the sorts of things that we've been uh, we've been you know, focused on, in addition to uh, structural wind loads and cladding. And a recent example here in uh, Vancouver, um, when that atmospheric river came through, I can't remember exactly when that was, but uh, there was some pretty severe winds, and I, you may have picked up on some of this in the media, but uh, a lot of that really, those really high value outdoor spaces didn't get the attention maybe from a wind engineer. And uh, there was there was quite, uh, I don't think anybody was hurt because of this, but uh, it's certainly the potential for some pretty severe outcomes of um, you know, debris in the form of furniture being blown off of, uh, off of terraces. Um, Another area related is in uh, in pavers and and roof material uplift. That's been studied for some time, but again, with these higher higher um, higher quality spaces being developed and the impetus on the part of developers to uh, to make this as part of their offering, um, you, we've we've gotten involved in these very um, you know very good setups for pavers, but. Um, Another thing that, that's been starting to happen is uh, designers like to get into um, really uh, really high quality finishes, and that could be so. So your so your old concrete paver, like the old lower right here, which still doesn't have much uplift capacity. It's only two inches thick, so it's about I think 22 pounds per square foot, or what's that? A little less than half a kPa. Um, that's not very much resistance to uplift. Uh, but even more more recently, uh, there's been uh, a move towards tiles and so very light ceramics. So that's it's it's become almost the um, the uh, the practice uh, the the necessary practice the uh, the threshold that engineers need to be uh, sought out for uh, for consulting on these sorts of things with the with the number of occurrences that have happened. And while I focused on wind, there's members of my team. Um, 
at CPP that uh, that are involved with snow. Um, and I'll just have a couple of slides on this, just as a just to make make the point that um, you know overall microclimate in, involves uh, different environmental hazards and assessing them. And, and in fact, we were just in the, uh, the code committee uh, yesterday looking at the effect of sliding snow and how to how to um, account for that in uh, potential roof drifts. But again, this has become uh, almost the standard of care to uh, to look at these sorts of things. Um, so these are a couple, of, I won't name the buildings, but there are a couple of examples from Toronto just from this winter. And um, and uh, what used to pass for uh, snow guards, um, that's become a developing field as well. So that's just some, uh, some background um, and maybe some observations and a little bit of background on the company and, and uh, my practice. And, and I'll shift now to, to talk about um, Things that have been happening in wind engineering practice more recently. Um, so, you know, I've been at this for about 25 years now, and it's it's interesting. I've had the the privilege to study with uh, with Alan and Barry and Dave Surrey and Barry Vickery and Dave Surrey and Nick Azimov, you know, the really founding group. And then uh, it was colleagues with uh, Greg and Greg Kopp and Hori and Hen Ping Hong and Ashraf Eldamati and that group. And then, um, and then gone on to uh, to private practice. Um, but over the course of that, of my 25 years, a lot of the things that we were still making assumptions about, in because um, because we didn't have the data, but you had to infer some things. Um, a lot of those challenges have become more clear in how to deal with it uh, because. Um, whether it's quality of metrological data, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that change happened. And um, while I was still at Western, we, we began looking at high intensity winds and a number of folks in the department have, uh, have looked at that and continue to, to make good contributions there. Um, and with the quality of data though, there's, there's more analysis techniques that are, that are available. Um, just at the top there, I, I mentioned the move to uniform risk. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that history over the last 10 years, but there's, um, you know, that, that really followed on some of the developments in seismic, but, but has led to some other observations as well. One of those being performance-based structural design, which again is kind of followed in the, in the footsteps of seismic. And even though I won't, I won't uh, go any further into this last point, but the uh, the increase of use of uh, CFD as a tool within uh, within wind engineering is is uh, rapidly developing um, to the point that uh, you know as a as a practitioner in wind engineering, you really need to have mastery or some level of mastery of of both tools. It's not one versus the other anymore. It's 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 uh, the appropriate use at the appropriate stage of a project or uh, depending on the, uh, the precision that one needs to, to enter into. Um, but often CFD is, is a great tool to help communication primarily, but also uh, been more quantitative in, uh, in recent times as well. So I'll just tackle a couple of these topics and then, and then show just some trends and some things that have been happening in codes that are, are uh, starting to, to push on practice. Um, if you haven't figured out already, civil engineering tends to move fairly slowly um, through the codes, but, um, but actually over the last uh, 15 years or so, I'll say that uh, that pace has been increasing either, either or I'm just getting old and, and time moves more quickly, but, um, but the, you know, the move towards uniform risk, it wasn't really thought about that way uh, as, a, as an explicit goal when we first began talking about it in ASCE 710. So uh, for the, again, the code cycles move slowly. So this was about 15 years ago when this was kind of put on the table. Um, and the reason that we went that way in ASC 710 was more because of some discrepancies between the high wind region and uh, the rest of the country, so the, the main part of the United States. 
At the time, we were working from a uniform hazard, um, nominally 50 years, and then importance factors applied to much the same way that the National Building Code of Canada still is today. Um, but the reason we started to think that way is because you had to have different, there was a different set of importance factors in high wind regions. There was um, some other, other discussions. So we, we made that move. Um, the calibration of the code at the time was fairly straightforward. You know, there was, uh, there was wind engineers involved in that, of course, John Paterka and uh, Peter Irwin being the, uh, the biggest of the, the names from the respective companies. And then Peter Victory was also involved, another Western grad. Um, and I'll say the early stages from implementation were, were actually quite controversial. I, I remember going around and giving um, talks and uh, I went to one in particular, I went to, to Chicago and there was a, a very well-known engineer, uh, John Zills from SOM. He was involved way back at the, the Sears Tower and the Hancock building. And he, uh, he really was quite upset about the change. Um, he didn't think the wind design uh, needed that change, um, that wind design as a, had, had evolved and, and there was no kind of case history of, uh, of significant failures. So he, was, he was really questioning the, the need to overhaul um, practice. And I've heard since that, um, you know, at the time there was, there was a lot of, you know, you can imagine that in an engineering practice, you have to reinvent or redefine or, or change your tools. And, uh, and people's intuition um, had to evolve quite quickly. So it was quite controversial. There were some things in the calibration that we, of the code that we knew were there. It was really calibrated around rigid structures. So follow um, a V squared relationship, but there's some challenges with uh, flexible structures and the loads went up and, and I don't want to give you all the history or bore you with all the history, but I, I had uh, endured a few lashings and scars uh, that, that formed uh, um, some of the ways that I've, I've since uh, communicated um, around code issues. But I'll say is that, uh, you know, over the decade that that's been here with us, um, that framework has really led to a number of insights where, you know, the move, it, so it was, it was couched in uniform risk, but that, that also, you know, opened up practitioners' eyes and thought processes to, to thinking much more about the actual event that is likely to, to lead to failure. So that even though it had a mean recurrence interval of 1700 years or 700 years or now 3000 years with just category four, you know, that's, that's a bit of an academic thought, but it does, it does put some things on the table that one um, should look like, should look at more explicitly. And again, those have been those have led to some some interesting changes in the code and some more um, explicit recognition of things. So the other the other thing this is related is uh, the improvement in the availability, improvement in the quality and the quantity and the availability of meteorological data. So going way back to the late '90s. Um, United States uh, National Weather Service, and I think there was another partner. Anyway, led, led to this automated surface observation system, ASOS. And um, what that entailed was a replacement of the equipment at all major airports. Now, now I think all airports in the United States. Um, I can't remember what the exact parallel was in Canada. It wasn't quite as, as good a, a change, but uh, there was some improvement there too. But we have this uh, through ASOS and the up updated equipment um, started to accumulate high quality continuous at one minute intervals data. And just as a history lesson up until that point, there was um, um, the wind records were taken as a two minute average before the hour every hour. And then if there was some unique events that were related to um, the flight control, uh, those were, were flagged in the record as well. So we went from that to something that's effectively continuous. And so as my career has gone on, um, 
we've now got over 20 years of that data. And that has allowed you know, a lot of insights. At CPP, our, our metrological data team, um, now led by someone that I recruited back into the field, um, but we've got a mix of folks from a wind engineering background. So Valerie Septon is her name and she's, uh, she's come back and um, similar vintage as I, so a lot of years of experience and, and insight. Um, but we also have um, meteorologists on the team. So they can very, very skilled at, in sifting through this data and pulling out different storm types. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, there's some other data sets that, that come along uh, with it, with, uh, with advancements in uh, weather forecasting. So reanalysis data sets that are available that really fill in a lot of the gaps in between the discrete observations at the airports. And uh, just to extend that thought, weather research forecasting model, WARF, um, is, is more accessible. And some of the very large projects, very big scale projects that I worked on at RWDI um, justified some, some modeling of, um, of different regions of the world using, weather, using the WARF modeling. And then the other thing I'll say too, it's kind of related to meteorological data, but uh, the damage investigations of, um, through, um, through the various organizations in the States and universities that got involved with that, but also industry partners, that led to uh, a much more of a, the, the industry being in tune. So some of, the, some of the questions like that experience I shared with the, uh, the very esteemed engineer, John Zills at SOM, a lot of those barriers started to, to come down. There was more interest in, in really digging deeper into the data and understanding. So we started to get things like um, wind hazard maps being talked about more openly. This is from a fellow um, that some of us know, some of your uh, colleagues and faculty know uh, from code committees, Tom Smith, he's a very good architect who's been involved in some of these damage surveys. Um, but he was a, he's been a big uh, promoter and advocate of um, of wind data. And then um, another thing related to uh, to tornadoes and and high intensity winds and storm shelter design. So you just started to see these these maps emerge and uh, talk about different hazards. I'll just focus here. Um, so I, I showed for for Collins relative to Denver is is about here. so it's interesting. Um, I've had I've had an education in understanding downslope winds. Um, so all the various special regions in those mountainous regions in the Western United States, and that extends close to Calgary and the like. Um, those are all influenced by what's called orographic winds, uh, but winds that are influenced by topography. And um, again, I've, I've, it's been a bit of an education for me because those were always just shaded areas on a map. And now I have colleagues that have been very invested in uh, understanding those. And, um, and the, the, the gradient and intensity of winds, and at the, yeah, the gradient, the geographic gradient, and the intensity of winds at the, at the foot of those mountains is, is quite severe. Um, in fact, it doubles or even more than doubles the, uh, the design pressures. So we've got the piece where the, the map started to emerge, um, but the other insight, when you start to look out at these longer return periods, is you start to think through, and you're forced to think through, what are the different hazards um, related to wind? I mean, it's not, just, it's not just a tornado, which up until the storm shelter folks got involved, that was kind of an academic thing. Um, when, and in, as a practice, we just said, oh, insurance takes care of it, which is, in hindsight, was a bit of a flippant kind of response to the to the issue, but um, we've we've been developing, and and obviously the contributions of uh, Western through Windy Dome and, and Northern Tornadoes projects and other things are right there with the front row seat to the changes. Um, but as we look now to changes coming in the code, so the the very recently released. ASCE 722 has now taken that into the body of the standard, which is a big deal, right? So the, the ASCE 7 is adopted in its entirety into the International Building Code, which then becomes the state codes and applied actually in uh, a number of international jurisdictions as well. Um, 
And the reason that was done was not from the storm shelter perspective, but when looking at the long return period or mean recurrence interval, then depending on the size of the structure, that the tornadoes actually started to impact your, uh, your reliability calculations. And so that's, that is a, a, quite a formal change that's now come into AC7. In Canada, um, Professor Hong and Professor Kopp are uh, again involved. Professor Hong from a reliability point of view and Professor Kopp's leading the Northern Tornadoes Project. Um, there's gonna be more contributions to come in the National Building Code of Canada. So for this current version uh, that's about to come out, uh, this is an update. Of, uh, of a map that you'll see in the commentary, but there will be some things to come in um, National Building Code. And so that's the other comment I just wanted to make about uniform or move to, to uniform risk is, um, is uh, there's been the political will in uh, Canada to start to push on climate change and some funding um, to, to look at that and some modeling. And one of the outcomes of that yeah, we're going to start to work on for the next code cycle, but um, we've been authorized to start to to look at that and and, and probably bring national building code national building code of Canada to uniform risk model as well. But now that is uh, um, not just wind, but snow as well. And ASC 722, that's another change. Is snow is now at a uniform risk level. So just to Drill into a little bit on the tornado risk map. Um, this is a design speed for a risk, certain risk category, but it, it's also it, it, it's a function of the plan area, which affects your strike probability, which makes sense if you follow the. Uh, I guess the most recent events in um, in Kentucky, where there was uh, a big part of the damage was I think a, a distribution center. And if you've looked, seen these distribution centers, they're just absolutely massive. Used to be the car assembly plants were the biggest, now these distribution, assembly, these distribution centers are now the biggest plan area type of structures that, uh, that are around. And just um, to add in a little bit of detail on uh, the type of storms. And so with the, with the kind of team that we've got at CPP with meteorologists combined with uh, folks that are trained in applied um, reliability, I'm thinking back to, I, I studied with it, I studied reliability and, and statistics with Alan Davenport, but then uh, Han Ping's, Han Ping Hong has been teaching that for a number of years. Probably, probably uh, one of the hardest courses um, I've ever taken, but probably, uh, but the most valuable, or among the most valuable, not not uh, notwithstanding any other high quality courses, but as but as far as um, you know, the the mastery of probability and being able to talk about it in lay terms to to a, a broad audience has, has become a skill that uh, that I've developed, and um, as I say, is is quite valuable to me in my practice. But just to give you a sense from this plot here, this is something that um, Tom Mara put together for me. But we've we've now we've got the skills to really dig into thunderstorm or whether that's uh, winter storm or downslope winds or um, or hurricanes. This is a, this is just a kind of a contrived climate. But but we've got the ability to really dig into those different storm types and um, and really push on that push on that example and take that all the way through the process. So now I'm starting to run short on time. So I'll finish the last topic here in performance-based design and some, some trends. So ASCE um, got behind a couple of efforts. Uh, one that really wanted to crystallize and capture how structural engineers and wind engineers work together today. And that led to um, the document on the left, which came out of uh, the Tall Buildings Committee of ASCE. And it was the first time really the, um, it was mid-career folks that, that really put that together. It wasn't the senior guys, it was so, uh, so Pretam and Pretam Biswas and John Pronto are now senior folks in the firm, but even, you know, they were up and coming just, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago when this was starting. And then the other key publication um, was the pre-standard for performance-based wind design. And 
that really was the, um, it, it became an ASC joint venture with the Pankow Foundation, uh, but it was really folks at the Pankow Foundation that, uh, that fund practical challenges in structural engineering. Uh, they were really the impetus behind it. And, um, and it came out of practice where, um, in particular, structural engineers on the West Coast they were dealing with a lot of seismic problems, obviously. And they would go through and do a wind design and they'd have to give back a lot of the gains that they had, they had developed through performance based for seismic. And we'll go into all, the, all those details, but the, the cost savings and the, and the reliability increases improvements were quite significant in seismic. And then they'd have to go through and then do a, a linear a linear structural design that's that was governed by first yield of a member in the, in the lateral system. And um, so that led to some development, a lot of conversations, a lot of consensus that, that uh, resulted in this first pre-standard for, for uh, performance-based wind engineering. And um, yeah, just a, this, this first version, um, was really focused on, on that idea of, can we let some yielding occur in the lateral resistance system? And is there a way to start to explore that post-yield behavior, um, knowing that structural systems are quite robust because of other things they bring into the design? So it's really a first, first step, that first pre-standard, um, but it does outline detailed workflow. It puts down, on paper, uh, the need for a rigorous peer review process, and um, and actually, the uh, we've we've just completed one in uh, Austin, Texas. That's the first one in the United States that uh, that has um, been fully implemented through that process, with the blessings and involvement of the authority having jurisdiction. That's quite a major accomplishment. Um, what it allows us to do, though, just to dig into it a little bit. So that's in Austin. Austin, Texas is a mixed climate. It has some uh, hurricane presence. It has some thunderstorm presence. And so these are things that we need to look at. Here's an example for Miami. Um, and uh, folks at the Barrier Wind Tunnel actually were the first to, to do this sort of process um, about 15 years ago now, I think, uh, storm passages. And um, what this what this new framework of performance-based design has allowed is a much deeper look, a much more open set of eyes and ears on the client side to, to really get into the wind engineering issues that, uh, that we look at. So here's an example where in Miami, you could have a, quite an intense hurricane go over right, right over the city and the peak wind speed and the, and the um, peak wind speed in the record um, may not actually align with the highest load effect. So we've got techniques now, again, started at Boundary and Wind Tunnel, um, and we've, we've started to expand those that uh, really bring that into a performance-based design. And then on top of that, we, um, we can layer in the wind tunnel data and give detailed time histories, and then the, the structural engineer takes that onto the model and uh, start, to look at, um, start to look at the impact, the outcome, any risks, but looking at uh, you know, some initial yields and what does that do to the structure? And uh, from reports, it actually leads to uh, quite significant savings. So not only from a, uh, from a cost point of view, which as you guys go forward in your career, that's always the one, somebody has to pay for it. So they need to be convinced. Uh, but also with these detailed looks, um, I'm convinced we're improving the reliability of the design as well. So I'll stop there. I'll just say that that, as I say, we've got that uh, we've got that one um, example and uh, several others that are are coming down the pipe. So. Thanks for everybody for attention. Um, I hope uh, I hope the format was okay. It's always difficult giving presentations on Zoom. I uh, I really depend on the audience feedback, but uh, I hope you were able to to get something from the presentation. And happy to entertain any questions at this time. Time allowing. Okay, thank you very much, John. Yes, it was very informative and very interesting. So. Um...
we can open the floor now. We can take maybe one or two questions. So, John, what what advice would you give to the graduate students now if as general advice for their career uh, going to industry and particularly with those who would like to pursue a career in wind engineering? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, well, first of all, do what you want, do what you like. Um, you have to have passion. You've all, you've all made the investment into, uh, into really furthering your education through graduate studies. Um, that is going to prepare you well, but it could take you in a number of paths. I, um, and be open. I guess have your have your mind open to those paths. Uh, if you wanted to pursue a uh, a career in wind engineering, my email is right there, so you can you can uh, get in touch with me. Only partially tongue in cheek. Um, I think the uh, you know there's there's a broad range of interests, and and we're excited as a firm with um, you know some of the things coming. And recognition, whether it's uh, climate change, things starting to become recognized in code. Um, we see a, uh, from my perspective, I see almost a maturing. That's it's kind of funny to say, given how long when engineering's around, been around. But it, one thing I didn't comment on too specifically is is um, as a engineering work product. Um, wind engineering reports are now much more visible within the design team. And uh, so I'd encourage you, in addition to your studies and the detailed technical work that you're doing, to really seek those opportunities while you're on campus. I know it's hard with uh, COVID, but to reach out to other colleagues or you know, establish a network because those networks of folks that work in other professions, they will they'll always benefit you. I'm, I'm, always amazed at the, uh, you know, the connections that I still keep. I just got in touch with somebody, just a real specific example. Somebody who was in chemical engineering as an undergrad is now the head of, uh, of um, climate resiliency for WSB in Canada, a massive company. And uh, so, so, you know, those connections will serve you well. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to, to go into wind engineering, it's a broad, it's becoming a broader a broader uh, field, not only just at specialty firms like CPP and RWDI and others, but uh, but also um, even at structural engineering firms and other firms that are, are considered broader in uh, in engineering projects. Okay, great. Okay, so I think we're approaching 2.28 now. So I would like to, again, uh, thanks Dr. John Galsworthy for very uh, variable and informative presentation. We know how busy he is and how valuable his time. So uh, this is really grateful, John, for uh, sharing your time with us. And we hope uh, we're gonna see you soon uh, in person. Yeah, and, I look forward to that. I look forward yeah. to that. And uh, best, of, best of luck to everybody yeah. in there. Okay. graduate studies and uh, nice to see so many friends again okay thank you very much john great thank okay. you nice seeing you thank you all bye